Father, as we continue in your presence, we ask, Lord, that as we open your sacred word, that from these pages you will speak to us, that our hearts and lives might be moved into a closer relationship with you. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. The phone rang, and on the other end, the person picked it up. This was indeed the days before cell phones. And Andy was calling, Henry, and he said, Hey, you want to get together for a Sandlot baseball game this afternoon? The response on the other end was, Sure, what time? Two o'clock. The game was all set. The arc of our message today will go from the Sandlot baseball game to international powers. So stay with me for just a couple of minutes. As the dozen or so boys gathered at the Sandlot, well before the days of manicured baseball fields, they all had their baseball gloves, one brought a ba brand new bat, and the other brought a brand new softball. They chose up teams, and everything was set for an afternoon of baseball. There's hardly anything better on a nice, warm summer day than to get some of the energy out of your young body and to see actually who's going to win, because there was quite a rivalry between the teams. Along about the third inning, the score was tied. And, wouldn't you know it, Tommy hit the ball, off it went bouncing to shortstop. Shortstop picked it up and threw it to first base, and the ball and the runner arrived at the same, tee, at the same time. One team yelled, He's out! The other team yelled, he's safe! And then started the fight. What's it going to be? There is something, even in the young heart, that is just a little bit selfish and wants its way. The one team that brought the bat said, we know he was out, and if he's not out, we're going to take our bat and go home. The other team that brought the softball said, he's safe, and if he's not safe, we're going to take our softball and go home. Those in the group that had a little bit of ambassadorial skills tried to talk across the teams and say, why don't we have him be safe this time and next time he'll be out. And the others that were strict ruler, just people who followed the rules said, that's not what the rules say. And the argument continued. How would you settle the score? How would you make the decision? What would you do when you don't get your way. For we find that as just a microcosm of what happens in humanity. For we go from the sandlot as those boys grow up to be men and rulers of nations and international affairs. And nations are saying, unless you do it our way and unless you agree to our terms, we have the Air Force that is on standby, that will deliver you some encouragement to listen to us. And we wonder, and the struggle goes on, how is it in the human heart today? It's, the Bible says it's deceitfully wicked, doesn't it? How is it that we can come to a code of conduct 
and a code of ethics that allows us to treat others with respect and with dignity. Our message today is entitled Purpose, Purpose, Time, and Life. You see, there is a hierarchy to life. We all value things differently, but we all realize that the things of international affairs are far more important than the things of baseball games, don't we? It's just a natural thing that implicitly we have a hierarchy of things. And I'd like to, I stumble across a story that I'd like to share with you, and then we're going to go to John chapter 5. It talks about the self-evident nature of realizing the hierarchy of things. Robert S. Hartman was a judge in Hitler's Germany, and in dismay, he watched as former classmates rose to power and effect, as he put it, the organization of evil. And he set out to try to, try to define a code of good and what it would look like. He lamented the fact that the technological miracles that hum, the human mind had brought about were not matched with moral and ethical in the moral and ethical realm. He was able to fill the gap. He saw the need, the need for a rigorous scientific way to organize ethical behavior. And here is his basis for it: human ethical behavior. Human human beings understand the value of things and ideas according to a hierarchy, some things are more valuable, no, valuable than others. As there is a deeply embedded logic to what hierarchy is, this logic is amicable to mathematical formulation. Humans, and he uses this illustration, humans tend to agree that people are more important than things, and things are more important than rules or codes of conduct. Most people would rush into a fire in a house to save a person. They would hesitate to run into a burning building to save a burning chair. There's an internal logic that accounts for these judgments. This is not to say that all are unanimous or uniform in their expressions of this logic all the time, for variation is part of humanness. What we cannot deny, however, is a logic of valuing exists, and that in our clearest and best moments, it's recognized universally and implicitly. The hierarchy exists not because a majority of humanity, human race, were polled and agreed to the values, but because it's simply self-evident. And we do recognize that there are people who do not hold these beliefs and place high value on them as we might. But society in general considers those who value things above people to be pathological. So just, just setting the foundation, I think we can all agree today, just by implicit reasoning, that we value people more than we do things. Do you believe that, friends? Yes. On the hierarchy, in God's worldview, he values people more than things, and things more than a code of conduct. So that's kind of a starting point. Let's turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we find there an interesting story. Because in John chapter 5, we find there, by way of comparison and contrast, the teachings of Christ and the teachings of society of the day. In John chapter 5, as we've read uh, in the scriptures today, Jesus came down to Jerusalem by the pool, which is called in Hebrew, the Seda, having five porticles, and these lie in a multitude, those who were sick, lame, blind, and withered, 
For the moving of the waters, an angel would come down uh, from heaven in certain seasons into the pool and stir the waters. And whoever was first to step into that pool was made well from whatever disease with which he or she might be afflicted. Oh, 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 that such a pool would exist today. Wouldn't it be wonderful, friends? Let's see. You have trouble with chronic rheumatism. Just go beside the pool. You have trouble with diabetes. Just go beside the pool. You have trouble with paralysis. Just go beside the pool. You have trouble with cancer. Just go beside the pool and wait. 38 years he had waited beside that pool. The problem was he was paralyzed and he couldn't get to the pool by himself. And everybody else was so busy getting into the pool that by the time he was able to drag his way even close to the pool, somebody else was healed. How was it ever going to be that he was going to be made whole and healed to his fullness? For the rules and the conduct of the day were the first one in the pool was healed. Not the second one, not the third one, not the fourth one, not the tenth one. It wasn't, it wasn't based on the need. It was based on the order in which they entered the pool. And Jesus came. Jesus came along and he saw the man and he asked him, who is this man? Um, as, as he saw the man, uh, for 38 years, he had been paralyzed. And Jesus answered, uh, looked at him and said, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps in before me. I love, I love the story. I love the story. What was the purpose of Christ's life? And I ask you, what is the purpose, parenthetically, of your life? Jesus looked upon him and simply said, Get up! Pick up your bed! Pick up your pallet! Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. I would love to have been there, wouldn't have you? And immediately, the purpose of Jesus was to place people and people's needs above everything else. Everything else was secondary. And everything that was secondary served that, was, that which was primary. And everything that was third served that which was primary. So let me ask you, friends. How is it in your life? People struggle sometimes figuring out what their purpose in life is. You have people that are 12 wondering, what will I do when I grow up? It's perfectly normal. You have people that are 32 that have gone through three careers that are 50 years old wondering, what should I do with the remainder of our, my life? Well, let me take you to John chapter 5 as we just peer for a few minutes. What Christ did with his life was to bless every person he came in contact with. The ethics of Christ's life was to place his desire secondary to the needs of others around him. It's contrary to human nature. For you see, when there's an issue that comes into our lives, more often than not, we want our way. And what you want can wait until my needs are fulfilled. Am I telling the truth today? It's awful quiet out there. There's just something in human nature that struggles, just struggles with purpose. Wait a minute. I've got something else to do. I can spend five hours a day before the video monitors and the TV like the average American, but I can't help my neighbor. 
I don't have time to come to church because I've been working so hard. I worked 80 hours this week. And I'll get around to doing it later. And purpose becomes secondary to that which is urgent. But in Christ's order of things, he placed people first. For when he left the when he left the thorn 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 room of heaven to come to this earth, he left it all behind for people, not things, not rules in code of conduct. So as we look at purpose, I believe we all can agree that he placed people first. But the second piece of John chapter 5 is a movement from purpose to time. For you see, the time in which he did this, the Bible records, now it was the Sabbath day. So that the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is a Sabbath day, it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. How is it that you dare pick up that rug that you had underneath you and your blanket and you walk away and carry it on the Sabbath day. Now, I'm not sure how you would react to that, friend, if you were carrying your pallet and you were carrying your blanket. I would just be tempted. I'm not a real bold person, but I would be tempted to take that pallet and wind it up and just maybe smile at them and as I went by, kind of give them a little whack across the back of their head. Like, what are you thinking? I've been lame for 38 years, and this man has healed me. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. How can Jesus be so disrespectful to the sacredness of the Sabbath? What is going on here? The religious leaders of the day scratch their heads. How can this be? He knows about time. He knows about the Sabbath. For you see, Jesus' purpose on the Sabbath was a purpose of blessing and doing good. And against such, there is no evil. There is no wrong. Did you hear me clearly? Amen. You can be doing everything right you can be doing everything right by sleeping all day Sabbath so you won't sin and lead an evil life. Do you believe that of your neighbor? It might be true of yourself. Let me be perfectly clear. If it is the avoidance of sin and the stillness and the lack of doing something wrong that fills your Sabbath day, you're missing a blessing. For the Sabbath days and hours were made for worship and blessing others, doing good, doing well, serving others, being the hands and the feet of Jesus. Against such, there is no evil on the Sabbath day. Others may say, wait a minute, you shouldn't be doing, to the, you shouldn't be doing that on Sabbath. You just say a prayer for them and you do well on Sabbath. Do you believe me, friends? Yes. Now, it's not on my word alone. John chapter 5, purpose and time. The Sabbath is a time of sacredness. So follow along. John chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It's a Sabbath. It's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered unto them, He who made me well was the one who said unto me, Pick up the pallet. Don't blame me and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said unto him, behold, you become well. Do not sin anymore so that you've made, uh, made nothing worse happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, 
and I myself am working. Oh, how absolutely incredible. Where's the man? I don't know. Let's go to the temple. He walks into the temple to give praise to his heavenly father for his healing. The Jews off in the side, he says, oh, excuse me. There he is. His name is Jesus. And the Jews couldn't stand it. The Jews couldn't stand it. They plotted right then and there to take the life of Jesus. Because in their hierarchy, it wasn't people. It wasn't things. It was the rules. And they had inverted the hierarchy, the universal hierarchy of heaven. And whenever we do that, it's an abomination of purpose. It's a betrayal of Christian ethics to place our wishes, our code of conduct, our rules upon somebody else. Because God may be calling them to do things and say things that we don't agree with in their unique background, in their unique ministry at that time, they may be following God's will. Do you believe that, friends? So I say to you today, church, how is it with your purpose? How is it with your use of time? How would you like to take and have seven weeks off a year to do nothing but ministry and a mission trip and reach and make a powerful influence for Christ in a local community or somewhere else. How many like to have seven weeks? I'm not talking about just a couple days, but seven weeks. Come on, how many of you like to have it? I got good news for you. You've already done the math. What seven times? You know, seven times seven is 49. How many days would that be? 50 days a year, 50 Sabbaths a year. That'd be what? Seven weeks. We have that time to do Christian service and move mission ahead. But here's another reason. Um, the Jews had so perverted the law that they made it a yoke of bondage. Their meaningless requirements had become a byword among other nations especially the Sabbath, hedged in by all manner of senseless restrictions. It was not to them a delight, the holy of the Lord and honorable. The scribes and the Pharisees had made its observance an intolerable burden. A Jew was not allowed to kindle a fire nor even light a candle. As a consequence, the people depended upon the Gentiles for those services. That which they could not do, they hired somebody else to do, so that they would not be breaking the Sabbath, but somebody else could on their behalf. God has given no commandments which cannot be obeyed by all. His laws and sanctions are not unreasonable nor selfish restrictions. Jesus had come to magnify the law and make it honorable. And notice with me this, this quote from Desire of Ages, page 207. I love this one. Because in, in, the, uh, in the weekly cycle, while we serve God seven days a week, there is a special time called the Sabbath a time which he pours out his blessings upon his people. It is so sacred and so special. Listen to this, and here's why I love the Sabbath. The demands on God are even greater upon the Sabbath day than other days. Did you catch that? As we spend time with God, the demands on God are greater on the Sabbath day than other days. Desire of Ages says, his people then leave their usual employment and spend time in meditation and worship. They ask more favors of him on the Sabbath than on other days. They demand his special attention. They crave his cherished blessings. And this is the part, if you don't, this is the part I would underline when you go home this afternoon and read it. God does not wait. God does not wait for the Sabbath to pass before he grants these requests. You like that? If you're too busy during the week, come commune. Lay your cares upon him. 
Desire of Ages says he doesn't wait before the Sabbath to end to hear those requests and grant those requests according to his will. Heaven's work never ceases, and men should never rest from doing good. The Sabbath is not intended to be a period of useless inactivity. The law forbids secular labor on the rest day of the Lord. The toil that is the toil that gains a livelihood must cease. No labor for worldly pleasure or profit is lawful on the day. But as God ceased his laboring of creating and rested on the Sabbath day and blessed it, so man is to leave the occupations of daily life and devote those sacred hours to healthful rest, to worship, to holy deeds. The work of Christ in healing the sick was in perfect accord with the law. It honored the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a space in time for three primary things for rest, for worship, and for service. Do you see the purpose of Christ being magnified in the time of the Sabbath? His purpose of rest, worship, and service. His pur Let's see if we can remember those three. His purpose of what? Rest, worship, and service. So we find John chapter 5, moving on, we, we, we find Christ placing people first. We find Christ doing well on the Sabbath and realizing it is not the code of conduct that is most important, but it's people that are most important because we can have a wide variety of ideas on the code of conduct. But in John chapter 5, we find there the promise. In John chapter 5, we find there the movement of the promise of life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, uh, we, have found, uh, we have found the movement from the Sabbath. He then talks about life and eternal life. Verse 24 says, Truly I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes who sent me has, what does your Bible say? eternal life. Now let me ask you this. When a person believes on Christ, does he have eternal life? <laughs> You're good Bible students, but only one person answered. Yes. When does he have eternal life? When he what? When he believes. How long is eternal life? It's eternal. Hey, you're good students. <laughs> this really boggles the mind of people. You know, the, the theologians, how long is eternity? Those who look into space, how long is eternity? This is real simple Bible teaching. He who believes, hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but it has passed out of death into life. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Eternal life in Christ goes back this way because of Christ's life and God's eternal life. A gift which he bestows upon us when we believe. Truly I say unto you, an hour is coming, and it now is, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live again. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is a son of man. Do not be marvel, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, in which all those in the tombs will hear his voice, and will come forth, those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life, and those who did evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. But the fact of the matter is we are saved by grace. And right now, friends, right now, the ethical peace and the invitation comes to you. How do you order your life? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about things in life are not of equal importance. My car, my house, pales in importance to my wife, my family, my church, 
my God. That which provides me a means of livelihood pales in importance compared to my relationship with Christ. Wondering about my eternal judgment pales in importance when I realize that that can be assured today, right here, right now. John chapter 5. Christ was illustrating purpose first, people next, codes of conduct last. How is it in the ordering of your life and the purpose of your life? Jesus extends the invitation today. Believe. Have the assurance. Have the boldness to go in service for Him in good deeds and good service on the Sabbath hours and through the week to value people the way that He valued people. You know, I'm going to segue just for a half a second. You know, we find some very strange things going on in the world today. We would find it strange, wouldn't we? If in the church, one church said, only people with green eyes can be members. You chuckle at that, don't you? Only people, only people that smile a lot can be hostesses. Only people that think like I do are part of the true remnant of Christ's church today. Oh, I've gone from preaching to meddling, haven't I? We struggle sometimes as a body. We struggle as individuals. And when I say we struggle, we struggle, and it's not so much a matter of the issue, it's a matter of prioritizing how much we value every person as Christ valued them. For you see, our differences usually are a result of our families of origin and the culture we grew up in. And we know it's right because mom and dad understood it that way. And historically, it's always been that way to which we must say, friends, we must say, if it is wrong, it is wrong. Green-eyed people have a place in the church. People who rarely smile have a place in the church. People under five feet tall have a place in the church. People over five feet tall have a place in the church because they were created in the image of God. And God created them and called them for a unique purpose in which He wants carried out. And how dare you or how dare I inhibit or prohibit or slow that progression of service down? To which the people of God say what? Amen. Go forth, friends. Go forth in service in Christ's love. Go forth to value the dignity of every creation because God created you unique. Realize the uniqueness of creation in the person beside you, behind you, in your family, in the work. The preacher as he preaches is so unique that some of you wonder, why is he preaching? I get it. But we serve a loving God who invites us yes. simply to believe, to be healed as the lame was that day, to have a relationship with Him, that we may enjoy the eternal life that He died on the cross to give us, that that life eternal continues from this place forward as we value people, as we value the sacredness of time and as we serve him from now looking forward to the day when we see him again let us pray father the stories and the object lessons in your scripture at times 
seem so simple. They're simple to understand and realize that they are stories from centuries ago. But the application into our lives, Father, we struggle with at times. We turn things around. We value things more than we do people. We want our own ways and impute our rules upon others. And we just want life, sometimes the way our selfish hearts want it. But Lord, in the quietness of this sanctuary, we open our hearts and our lives to you. And we ask, Father, that you will heal us of the brokenness of relationships, of the bitterness, of the prejudice, of the feelings that we have that are not like Christ, that you will fill us with your Spirit, that we will value others the way, Father, that you valued others that allowed Christ to die on the cross that we will find the sacredness of time from Sabbath to Sabbath to rest, to worship, and to serve. That we will find the full appreciation of the assurance that our relationship with you is present today and will continue. Bless us, Father. Empower us and embolden us to be more like Jesus, we ask in his precious name, amen.